Okay. So we are about to do this intentional walk and we're going to use the Colorado Trail as a base for that walk and take some side detours and so we're going to be on foot for about a couple months and we're doing some of the same things that through hikers would do you know cat we're uh sending food to ourselves and stuff like that and yeah using a main route that a lot of through hikers are using but we're we're really wanting to do it more intentionally and one of the things we're going to do is carry seeds with us and some of our resupplies are going to have seeds as well and Gabe has all of our resupplies have seeds in them yeah all the resupplies have seeds in them Gabe's done <clears> the Colorado <throat> Trail before and he's also somewhat familiar with some of the spaces we'll be walking through so he kind of picked out seeds that would be relevant to those locations and most of these seeds are like native first food plants and some of them grow already in this area and some of them have relatives that grow in this area and so Gabe did a lot of collecting of seeds last summer up in Oregon and um, Idaho and Washington. Washington and so this summer is all about dispersing them and putting putting them back into the land and uh, replanting them and and you know finding other wild gardens and um, and adding this genetic diversity into those wild gardens <clears throat> through walking where you really can see things and going at a human's slow pace so we're not going to be going like 30 miles a day or anything too so by going at this human slow pace we were really able to see we're probably so gonna much be more. going about eight miles a day yeah walking really slow we're gonna be bringing some different gear instead of bringing hiking poles and bringing a titanium digging stick um to help move rocks and dig up and disturb the the soil so these seeds can have safe places to um stay until they can germinate next year so you know if you just scatter a lot of these seeds out and surface sow them they're not going to germinate but if you they really like disturbance and they like rocky soils so i'm going to use this this digging stick to uh dig up rocks and to and to create texture which creates little shelter moist sheltered moist and shady spaces for these seeds this is an example of one bundle that we're sending ourselves in one of our food supplies. So all of this in addition to the food. And usually, bringing. just so if any of y'all get ideas from this, I don't, I keep these seeds. I have pillowcases of these seeds and I store them in cloth and paper bags, mainly pillowcases. Um, they like to breathe, you know? So this is a temporary thing, keeping them in plastic bags. Um, and we're gonna, right now we're here at our first resupply and we're with a, a bucket of our food and with these seeds and we're going to dig a hole and we're going to bury the bucket with our food and seeds. And so we don't have to hitchhike into town when we get to this spot. We'll just be able to get here, dig up our bucket, pull the seeds out. And one of the ongoing aspects of doing these bucket caches is, uh, can, making this an ongoing thing I'm not we're not just gonna leave the buckets out here and never come back to them these buckets are gonna be kind of established caches because um, we're trying to resurrect and bring awareness into the backpacking culture of these kind of traditional life ways and how a lot of the trails in the Colorado Trail in particular were old ute um, hunting and migration trails and these migration trails followed uh, specific wild gardens. wild gardens that they tended and so this is uh, a, like an ethnobotanical research project and a big planting project and it's gonna be interesting to see like how many seeds if we're sending ourselves too much or enough or too little seeds because 
um, just scouting these out and burying our caches, we've already I've already found spots that I'm like, oh, these are perfect spots to be planting these seeds. So I'm gonna have to when we get back to Durango, we're gonna I'm gonna make a few more seed bundles and have them for my friend to send me if in, in case I I decide that we don't want, have enough want more seeds, you know. So just a little overview of what we have and and some of the other uh, resupplies will have some other types of seeds too but uh, this is Yampa right mm -hmm. and because this is done on an iPhone right now you won't we won't be able to like see totally up close but at some point during the trip we'll definitely do some close-ups of the seeds so you really can see the differences in them but this is Yampa or dirt candy or what's the scientific name para Periteridii. Periteridii in yeah. the carrot family and they look kind of like cumin or fennel seeds caraway, they caraway. Say, call it wild caraway yeah it's really it, it smells amazing you could easily like mistake this for some kind of culinary like spice in like yeah. mainstream commerce and this plant has like a usually has like a white umbel right mm -hmm. and it gets pretty like tall compared to some of the, these other this plants. Is, this is an early yampa, so there's early yampa and late yampa. Mm -hmm. The late yampas uh, finish in September. They finish mm -hmm. a little later and the early yampas finish in July and August. So there's not like as much yampa in Colorado so far that we've seen or heard about compared to the Pacific Northwest and California. That is yet to be but proven we're, though because in the Traditionally, the Yampa, there was a band of youths called the Yampa Tika in the White River area, and there's the Yampa Valley and the Yampa River in the Steamboat Springs area. And Yampa was a old indigenous word for common root, you know, and that there's landscapes and rivers here in Colorado named after Yampa. And my friend Nikki has gone and investigated this area and found, um, the fragments of the old yampa gardens and dug that yampa and it, it is a type of late yampa and that's another eventual project so there is a deep connection to the utes and the yampa it was a really important food for them i'm just i'm very curious how much of it we'll see out there i'm really praying that we do because i just haven't seen it like i've seen it in out the west, northwest in like the further yeah. west from here so yep so we're bringing this to plant and or and hopefully like encourage more yampa to grow here yeah. And then this is this is Lomatium caus, Lomatium caus, and Fritillaria pudica seeds, or uh, yellow bells, yellow bell seeds, and there yeah. definitely are yellow bells here. Other yeah. variety species of yellow bells. Yeah. And then there's there's other species of Lomatium here. Yeah. So. Um, it also looks like there's some like some wild onion in here too. So. <clears throat> yeah, these seeds. Uh, these are flatter seeds, right, compared to some of the other, like the, say, the Somoptera seeds, right? Yeah, Somoptera is a different genus, and they have, their seeds are more shaped like little stars. They have more wings. So Lomatium's in the carrot family as well, and then Yellow yeah. Bells is in the... It's a lily. Lily family? Yeah. And Wild Onions is in the, is the Allium, yeah. so... Yeah. So we're planting some of this, and then this is the wet meadow in a bag, wet, wet meadow in a bag, garden, right? wet, wet garden in a garden bag. Garden in a bag. So there's a combination of things in this bag that Gabe collect. You collected this in one ecosystem all together, yeah. right? This is like a microclimate in the on the tableland in southern Oregon. There's these. It's like a desert table, and then there's these river, like per, uh, these ephemeral rivers that run that flood during the spring runoff. And that river that creates a little microclimate and whereas the whole table land is like lomatia macrocarpum and the different kinds of biscuit roots that like it really dry in the yampa <clears throat> these rivers have a microclimate of uh, where it's more of a wet meadow wetland so there's sausage luxe biscuit root which they call it sausage luxe because the the roots of these link like sausages you know so they'll have one tap root that links and then goes into another tap root that links and they can have up to four of those there's a uh, camas camisia quamash in here and then a, a wild onion that likes that wetness and then uh, <clears throat> white brodia in here and there's probably some yampa seeds in here too but so 
we'll obviously be p picking out a particular place to, to put this that would would uh, yeah. be similar to the ecology where he gathered them initially. Yeah. So, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> we didn't already talk about this one yet. Not right? yet. This is a combination of lomations. Yeah, this is probably like six different lomations. Uh, diff six different kinds of biscuit roots. The ones I know off the top of my head are Lamatia macrocarpum, the Big Mac, and then uh, nine leaf biscuit root. Two biscuit roots that I got seed from in uh, Lapway, Idaho, on the Nimipu Reservation, and Lomatium dissectum, which is a medicine Lomatium, and. Um, And, and well, you planted some of these on your parents' land, and yeah. they definitely germinated. So. Yeah, definitely. I've been moving these into Colorado, into the sagebrush. And, um, oh yeah, and there's also the Lomatium, the celery leaf Lomatium, uh, what is it, the Nudicali in here. And when I, I planted um, a bunch of test plots in Colorado, and the ones that seem to have done the best were the nudicali and the, the Lomatia macrocarpum. They seem to really like those uh, dry clay. Yeah, you, your parents' you know, land is particularly dry. And clay. And clayey, so yeah. it's kind of cool to see like in such a tough climate yeah. what did well. And there was another section that it's gonna be the east side of the collegiate. So the collegiate mountain wilderness, or there's a west side that goes around the west side of the collegiate mountains and then the east side and on the east side there was I remember a lot of um, calicordis lilies and I harvested a good sized bag of calicordis macrocarpum when I was in Oregon which has a bigger bulb about that big and a flower that gets much larger and they're purple pink flowers and so for that particular section I put um, a bag of I, I put a whole bag of that particular calicordis lily in that because I really want to plant that there because that section is very ponderosa sage service berry you know it's I just so I was kind of thinking about the habitats from my memory that we'll be walking through and custom fitting custom customizing the size of the seed bundles and what seeds we put in them so we're not bringing really uh apricot pits or plum pits or anything no, in this because no. it's not really the right time of year to plant yeah we're gonna do a, a big stone fruit planting that'll be in the fall, in the fall. not on the colorado trail but yeah. in other places so we're focusing on these carrot family plants and some lilies and yeah. the fritillaria and stuff so uh and you know some of these have crossover here already like that the, the same species might grow here and some of them don't necessarily yeah. but again it brings up that conversation and we'll talk about this more in depth on the trail and get more in depth in what this project really is but um just thinking about how it is okay to bring a lomation species from another place to this place because that has been done for a really long time by humans by other animals mm -hmm. birds and the reason there is such a diversity of these first foods when you really get to know them is because um before colonization, the, tr the trade networks of Turtle Island by the indigenous people of Turtle Island were so sophisticated and far reaching and ecological that they were moving seeds and moving plants that were valuable cultural, culturally and med medicinally and as food. And um, one example connecting to the Utes here in uh, where I'm from in Durango, Colorado, there is a type of uh, Brodia, the wild hyacinth that only grows in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia. And there's one isolated population of it in the San Juan Mountains yeah. in southwestern Colorado. <clears throat> and that's the only other place it grows other than in the Northwest. And um, that was because the Utes liked that plant and they brought it there and planted it there. So we're... Um, honoring them in this too and it's um gonna be really <clears throat> cool to walk this trail with new with new eyes this time and i definitely want to acknowledge like that this is such a privilege to be able to do and um the ease 
of being able to move through these lands and uh, also that these gardens are disjunct because of colonization and like that for me doing a walk like this without having some sort of participation doesn't quite feel right yeah without participation in this kind of way i mean everyone can have their own like perspective on what that should be for them but um i've done some hikes before on like these traditional through hikes like part of the appalachian trail and stuff and just the culture of like disconnect even though people are enjoying the land and being outside and camping and stuff they often don't even know what trees they're sitting around or what flowers are growing around them <clears throat> and and just the ecological and cultural history and context yeah. of of these landscapes too and i have a a people have bit no of, idea. I have an antipathy for, you know, American consumer backpacking culture because, one, it is, uh, you know, it is just a tentacle of, like, the squid of consumer culture, you know, and um, one thing that I have noticed is that it, it's based in the objectification of the earth, our mother, you know, like, when you treat the landscape as an object of your enjoyment and as a place to just escape you know and don't ask yourself does this landscape actually enjoy me being here you know and like what can we do to make this landscape enjoy us better and in this we're kind of uh gonna be trying to educate people on a middle ground between you know trashing things and leaving no trace you know and that's a polarization that i've seen is really harmful because both sides of that are based in the fact that we're only visitors here and that we're separate and we're not you know we're humans are ecological beings and whether we know it or not we're constantly participating in cultural landscapes whether that's uh, a town a city or a monocrop of corn you know we're always co-creating cultural landscapes and how um, these landscapes are uh, they, they really miss the presence of of people that see and live want to live with them not on them not off of them but live with the and ecology right not to say that we are perfect in some way and not like, at all that we aren't bringing all. things from stores to eat no. and stuff like that but we're just trying to to create another pattern you know and participate you know and we're not yeah. also not trying to co-op you culture or anything like that Absolutely but i think not. that we're trying to figure out some other way like you said a yeah. middle way um yeah. to to learn more about the land while also participating in it because i'm really yeah. curious about what plants are on this trail just for my own general curiosity too and my interest in and in love of plants and also feeling like by moving through this landscape on foot that we have the ability to plant these seeds we mm -hmm. might as well you know we and might as well um leave it better than we found it rather than leaving no trace like leave it leave it more abundant than we found it leave it better you know you know and some of these won't necessarily survive because they're not uh, perfectly adapted to this place but what's often really interesting about plants is that when you put them in new environments or like environments that maybe are similar but not totally 100 percent like what they're used to they can do interesting things and yeah. the ones that survive might, might adapt better to that place and um and there and plants often have so many phenotypes and ways of expressing themselves and humans are a part of i mean humans and plants wouldn't exist without each other you know yeah. so i think that um doing this will be really interesting maybe we'll come back again in, in the future and we'll take notes of the spots where we plant that's or definitely like definitely a long-term goal or even where, where we notice there are already gardens and then come back and then see yeah. them again at, in the future and see what what they're doing so that's definitely a long-term goal is to come back in a year or two and check on what we planted yeah totally and, and keep that because this is part of this project is <clears throat> with changing climates a lot of these a lot of these foods like biscuit roots are trying to move their range already because they are um, being affected by warming temperatures you know so we're up here at about 9,000 feet and most of the Colorado Trail is averaging pretty high 10,000 feet and we're moving these uh, food plants into higher altitudes so they can and that that's that's a that's been an observed fact that 
plants and animals are starting to change their range because of uh, changing climates and they're moving either farther north or higher in altitude. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of just lending our feet to mm -hmm. the plants and and um, helping them do that. And then it's also just an ongoing research project too. To and for me, you know, having lived on the road for a while, where a lot of my intentionalness behind that is spending time with plants and learning them and how they're all connected together across the land uh, in connecting ecosystems. So for me, this is a treat because I like been wanting to do something more intentional on foot and slower for a while yeah. now. So I'm really excited about like what what I'll come away with too from this. But yeah. before we go, I wanted to speak, wrap it back around and kind of comment on what Gabe said about not seeing the land as an object to to use um and how our culture kind of encourages us to do that if you really think about it um everything like from our time has to be objectified and monetized our bodies and also the things around us like you know uh that everything around us has to be a means to an end to serve some uh, part in the wheel of capitalism and you know um, including like you know the seeing the, the forest is just a timber harvest you know it's just standing money or standing material you know and I, I studied philosophy and there was something that really stuck with me when I did this kind of idea there was a philosopher Martin um, Buber who really talked a lot about this idea of like how we as humans can see each other as objects as well and if our whole world and culture is encouraging us to see the land as an object then we also see each other as objects so I think trying to shift that lens can look a lot of different ways it can be the way you love the land or way the way you love other people it could also be the way that you act on the land and with other people and like what you choose to do with your body and time and um, I think just even small actions of uh, stepping away from that encourage, encouragement from our culture of seeing things as a means to an end is one step in kind of helping transform the whole picture. So not to say that all through hikers or people who do these kinds of like race or like athletic oriented like hikes are doing that, but I think that it's you can definitely feel that energy in but it is, cult it, it, it is an overall culture you know regardless of the intention of the individual yeah you know people who do their walks like they are still feeding you know a consumer capitalist culture you know with like having the latest gear having the latest and gear and how the, fast can you go the gear the gear world is like that's a very wealthy industry of outdoor gear it's really expensive mm -hmm. it's all really like none of no modern backpacking gear is actually environmentally safe either you know it's not going to biodegrade in a clean way yeah. and so we're not really uh we're not um doing this in the usual way and it's i'm excited to to um to do this because i've never done anything like this before and last night i decided to call this walk a plant ago <laughs> like like uh like plantain you know it's like white man's footsteps right so we're um we're kind of shifting you and know so hopefully it's not seen in it. it's like plantain well, obviously it was brought here but it's a really amazing they call beautiful it, plant they too, call that it, we're accepting this here and we're using yeah, it and they call it white man's footsteps and there's like the there's the reputation that's based in a lot of truth that like what you know white man's foot what we're left in white man's footsteps was not was was um was environmental destruction and stuff so we're not only planting as we go this is a plant a go-go <laughs> we're also um shifting you know what is left in our footsteps and in, in our footsteps here we're gonna we're gonna leave uh roots and and wildflowers growing out of our footsteps mm -hmm. you know and i think that that's like um almost like ritualistically a healing act too for mm -hmm. for people and well maybe we'll also rec be recording a podcast we kind of tried and then we're like deciding we might want to re-record it but yeah. maybe before we go 
we'll be recording like a bigger podcast kind of conversation about this thing and yeah. I just wanted to do a little video to share yeah. too just to, before we bury these seeds <laughs> and um, yeah just so yeah. it's like a word to sum up what we're doing the plan to go it's a walk that's based in reciprocity rather than just like getting from point A to point B it's like a and just saying you did it to, to conquer yeah you know, so we're like, in a way, we're kind of challenging just like the American um, outdoor rec creation culture, mm -hmm. you know, which more often than not wrecks this creation than and objectifies it and monetize it. We're like really trying to spread like this message that to be a part of place and to live a really place based way and have that deep heart centered connection to place you have to participate and that's why like in the word participate the first part of it is part you know so and that everybody and anybody can be a part of their place by um just participating in it whether you're like a soccer mom in the suburbs going out and planting peach pits with your kids or you know if you live on horseback most of the year no matter what you what what you do or where you are whether you're in an inner city um there are <clears throat> so there's so many ways to participate because a city is just as much a cultural landscape as any you know and the only place that we are actually separated from these landscapes is in our minds and in our hearts you know because no matter how unconscious we are of it, we are still co-creating and participating in cultural landscapes and we have a really powerful sphere of influence in doing that and oh, that's okay. that's okay. well, let's, planting seeds is a powerful is a powerful act let's you know? go ahead and, and end this so we can get these buried so we, can, we can elaborate more in future okay. uh, shares so um, we'll be updating you